Okay, so we're back to part two, Ted Bundy's uh, evolution of a serial killer. We've already talked about the first two victims, the first confirmed two victims, the attempted murder, sexual assault of Karen Sparks, and then the abduction um, later on within, what, the same month? Uh, of Linda Healy yeah, it was like 26 27 days later so now we're going to move on to Bundy's third victim his third victim is Donna Manson uh, this abduction occurred March 12th 1974 so that's about a month period from his last known and first confirmed murder of Linda Healy. That seems about right. If you if you look at Bundy's timeline, you're going to see when these people went missing and when they, you know, were murdered. It's about a month. Although there are some variations and sometimes there's more within a month. What you have to be worried about more importantly is the gaps because that is where I feel are more victims that have not been identified. Now Bundy did con confess to this Manson, Donna Manson murder, um, but what I wanna do is I'm curious as to what the difference is between this one and the previous one. Okay, did he learn something? And from my research, I, th I think we can say that he did. And those things that we see are, he's moved locations. The first two murders, attempted murder and murder, of Sparks and Healy were within a couple blocks of where he lived. Now why? Why is that? Well, through my experience and my research and looking at serial killers, it's because they're comfortable there. Okay? Most serial killings will begin with either an acquaintance, somebody they know, and or within their area, their area of comfortability. Okay, because you gotta figure they're they're nervous. They've had all these fantasies built up in their head of the way things are gonna go, and they rarely go that way. But they they're they're nervous. They have to implement this action. So it's very difficult. To make that leap, you're stepping over that line because once you cross that line, there's no coming back. So, Bundy has done this, okay? He's done this with Healy. He killed her, abducted her, and now he's on to the third victim. So, he moves locations. Is it because he's comfortable in this location? This location being the uh, Central Washington University. Well, maybe he's comfortable there. He's definitely comfortable on campus. Although he is older than most students, I believe he was 27 at the time, uh, he still fits in. Um, he almost could pass as a professor, but he could also pass as a student. And that is one thing about Ted Bundy that is so unique, is that he is like a, a chameleon. He can change, he can blend. Again, to me, he's the perfect serial killer or was, I should say. 
So Donna Manson is 19 years old. She, in this, again, victimology, she's a free spirit. She have ta has taken, like, witchcraft courses and is into that stuff. Uh, and I guess early on in the investigation of her disappearance, that's witchcraft and devil satani satanic uh, component was mixed in way too heavily. But this is the 70s. Um, they thought maybe that it had something to do with that. She was on her way to a concert that was being held there at the university and she disappeared. Now she had talked to some people about meeting and, and I haven't confirmed this but I read this in my research that she had told people that she had met a guy whose name was Ted um, earlier. Now that's significant because if that's the case his tactics, his MO of how he abducts women maybe doesn't come into play here. But again, that was unconfirmed and I don't I don't necessarily believe that. And the reason I don't believe that is because I believe this is the first time he used his patented ruse. And that ruse being his arm in a sling. And pretending that he needed help now why do I think that well I'll get into that because that will go to the next victim so Donna Manson disappears and she is not reported missing for a while because she's a free spirit okay she's gone missing days at a time she just picked up and would go so she wasn't reported missing for a while which is in big contrast to Bundy's next victim Ted Bundy went to the electric chair and he started confessing to some of these murders. He actually said that he had taken Donna Manson's skull and incinerated it to ash in his girlfriend's fireplace. Now, you'll say... Well, they, they found a skull, you know, or they found remains um, where Bundy's other victims were. Why don't you just test them for DNA? Well, back then they couldn't. However, that gets me to this next point is when these bones were found in August of 1978 in the area of the Cascade Mountains and the and Taylor Mountain of where Bundy said he dumped his victims, there was a multicolored shirt also found, and that is what she allegedly was last seen wearing. But in the late 70s, early 80s, and this is a quote from the newspaper, during a routine purge of the Sheriff's Department's evidence room, the skeleton, or skeleton and the remains that were found were destroyed. I sincerely hope that that is a mistake that the newspaper said that. If any police department would throw away unknown human remains, they ought to be brought up on charges. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Well, take that back. I've heard some other crazy things. But this has got to be up there. I understand they had no concept of DNA back then. But that's somebody's that's somebody's loved one. Even if it isn't, it, it is somebody. You can't just discard them. I, I hope that that's a mistake. But that is, I've taken that right from a newspaper. So, Bundy confessed to at least a half a dozen. So, 12 of these girls, he took a hacksaw to their heads. Some of them he took to his rooming house. And 
allegedly, according to Bundy, Donna Manson's head was burned in a fireplace at a house. I don't know how believable that is. Again, Bundy's confessions are... They're not great confessions. He can't talk about a specific case when they ask him, okay, tell us about Donna Manson. He can't say, hey, I was using a sling in a cast, I picked her up with a ruse, I sexually assaulted her, I raped, I killed her at this place. He doesn't do that. It's like, I don't remember. Well, can we show you pictures? Because that's what I would do. Hey, I understand you don't know names, but if I show you a picture, he says, no, because they... They hardly ever look like they do in a picture. It's odd to me because most serial killers will want to relive that fantasy. Yet Bundy, honestly, the only time that I've seen that he appeared to do that was at trial. When he was cross-examining, yes, he was cross-examining a witness because he was... An attorney and I use those quotes and I'll say that loosely and he had the first police officer on scene of the Chai Omega house relive repeat in great detail what he observed when he got there that is when it seemed to me that Bundy was reliving it a little bit but in the confessions, maybe he's smart enough to know that, hey, I'm asking him to repeat this stuff on cross-examination. That's not incriminating me, and I'm reliving it. If I do it in a confession, it's incriminating me. Yet, he was going to the electric chair within two or three days. But he still would not really confess in great details. It was like bits and pieces and it was very jumpy and it wasn't straightforward. So whether he burned Manson's skull or not is still up for debate. That was on March 12th, okay, 1974. On April 17th, Susan Rancourt, age 19, disappears. A complete and totally different victimology than Donna Manson. She is safe. She's predictable. She's a straight-A student. She's not a free spirit. She is not prone to to go anywhere. She was actually coming from a safety meeting when she was abducted by Bundy. Now, what's interesting about this, again, this happened April 17th. Donna Manson was March 12th, so about a month in between. Yet, people came forward and said uh, five days previous to this, so on April 12th, exactly 30 days from the Donna Manson abduction a man approached a girl and he had a sling on his arm and he was carrying books and he was fumbling with them and he asked this girl to help him take it to his car he did she noticed that the front passenger seat was removed he asked her to get in and she refused and he asked her again she refused and and left it was certainly Ted Bundy, and that girl escaped death. We fast forward to April 17th, when Susan Rancourt is abducted. Two hours before this. So she, Susan Rancourt, on, at 10 o'clock at night, she had gone, put her clothes in the washer, went to this meeting, and then coming back from the meeting, she never picked up her clothes from the washer. So that's how they're able to determine approximately what time she was abducted around 10 o'clock. But two hours before that, so roughly around 8 p.m., while she's at this meeting, this guy in the sling 
approaches another girl named, uh, I believe it was D. Oliver. And she, the same ruse, carrying books. Hey, can you help me? I'm fumbling with them. My arm's in a sling. He takes her, she takes the books all the way to his car, which is parked in a very dark place. Uh, the darkest place on campus, according to some. He drops his keys. She thinks something's kind of up. She, and it is. He drops the keys because he's going to club her in the head with a crowbar that he has secreted in the back of his vehicle. Although, so she thinks something's up. She says, hey, let's back up a little bit and look. And when she did, she picked him up quick and gave it to him. Didn't give him time to reach for the crowbar and hit her. And then she left. Another girl who escaped death. Now the difference between those two attempted abductions is the description. One girl says he was shaggy, had crap clothes on that were wrinkled, had a, glasses, had a hat. The other girl says he was clean cut, looked good, dressed well. So they didn't link it. There's no doubt that was Bundy, and that was one of his greatest skills. Not only a manipulator, but a chameleon. Okay, he could change his appearance, he could change his mannerisms for each independent person, how he wanted them to see him. And they didn't link that, but it was undoubtedly Ted Bundy. So two hours before Susan Rancourt, he tries, he fails, He's still around. He still has that urge, okay? The sexual, sexual gratification that needs fulfilled. And the way that he fills that is through not only violence, but now he's crossed the line to murder. And Susan Rancourt falls for the ruse. Now, we don't know that specifically because Bundy never really talked about Susan Rancourt. He wouldn't talk about it. And again, that goes back to, I, I don't know the reason why he won't talk about some of these cases. To me, it almost is like he has remorse. Although, psychologists who study Bundy will say he had no remorse. So, I don't know why it is that he will not talk about some of them, but he does not talk about Susan Rancourt. Now... She's abducted, and right away, the next day, there's a reward. Parents are there from Alaska. They know something's wrong because of her victimology. So what has changed from these murders, Manson and Rancourt, from his previous ones, Sparks, the attempted murder, and then Healy? Well, right off the bat, those first two, he broke into a home, right? He entered the home and did his damage. The first one, he left her there. The second one, he abducted, but he still made entry into a residence. Now, he's progressed. He's moved to a different location, away from his house, away from these other two victims where they were, to a... A university and now he's using a ruse a con arm in a sling a cast I need help again preying upon the vulnerability of these girls who will help him why now why has he gone from entering residence and abducting them from there to taking them right off the street is one more riskier than the other? Remember, the last two I said is so brazen. Because he doesn't know, or he may know, what's waiting him inside that house. But now he's not going into the house. Why? This is important. Is it? Is it because what I believe, something happened... In the Healy abduction from inside that house that's made him change his ways. I think it's because he didn't have the time 
with the girl that he wanted. Something spooked him from that house. Although he was there for a, a, the more, a more amount of time than needed to abduct. Because remember, he took her blood-soaked nightgown, hung it up in the closet, made her bed. See, these are things that I want to know. That's the questions I would have been asking Bundy had I had an interview with him. Before his death, I would say, hey, why did you take the time to make that bed? Why did you take the time to do that? Why did you change from entering residence and abducting to taking them off the street? There's a reason for that. I want to know why. We can only surmise now, but those are questions I would have asked. My opinion is he didn't have enough time with them. Inside the house, too many things can go wrong. They're in a comfortable environment. He's never been inside that home before. Maybe he has, but I doubt it. He doesn't know who's spending the night. He can't do the things that he wants to do. He can abduct them, but maybe something happened there that it was difficult. He had to obviously carry her out, either through a window or through an unlocked door. And maybe 100 pounds, is, it was heavy for him to take all the way. So now he comes up with the plan. You know what? That was too difficult. That was too risky. I'm going to come up with this ruse. I'm going to put my arm in a sling. I'm going to prey on their vulnerability of them helping me. As soon as they put my books into my car, which I removed the front seat from in order to help me do this, I'm going to hit them with the crowbar, handcuff them, and throw them in there and be gone. Let's try that. And that's what he does. So you can see the evolution of Ted Bundy, the serial killer. And again, it's my opinion, he's changed that MO from entering residence to taking them off of a college campus. Now again, but and for to have more time, to have more time to do what his fantasies tell him to do. But abducting girls from a crowded campus is risky as well. So it shows you that although he mitigates the risks, he's trying to, risks do not bother him. And that is a clear sign of a narcissist. He's fascinating. He really is. Ted Bundy is a fascinating individual. Sick individual. I don't lose a day's sleep that he's dead. I would have liked to learn a lot more from him. Yet, he's still, for my genre, for my vocation, he is a fascinating study of not only human behavior, but the meticulous planning, execution, and why do you kill in such a manner? And he can answer all those. And he did a little bit on some, you know, explaining how the girls taking their last breath, he felt like he was God. And that he possessed them now. And they became a part of him. Uh, just really crazy stuff. But this is the first time he used that ruse. And if the ruse works, and we're going to see in the next two victims, or three victims, and the next set of videos that I do, whether he sticks to that ruse. Because remember, if a ruse is working, or if... Whatever you're, you're doing is working to fulfill your needs, you will stick to that. So we'll see if he sticks to this ruse. It worked in these two murders, Manson, Rancourt. I don't see why he would change it up, but we'll see whether he does or not. Susan Rancourt's skull was found on Taylor Mountain along with uh, some of the other victims later on and they were found by Bob Keppel. The reason they knew it was hers is because she had a lot of dental work done and they could see that right away from the fractured skull. 
she had a fractured skull she died from blunt force trauma it looked like probably from the crowbar I mean that she might not have died from that don't get me wrong she probably was strangled but the fractured skull was probably from the initial crack of the crowbar and remember Bundy he was a necrophilia he had sex with dead bodies he oftentimes returned to where these girls were and would have sex with them with the whole body or when he severed the heads he would just use the heads can you imagine that that's sometimes why the head of Susan Rancourt was found but her body may not have ever been found and that's that's crazy to think he would go there and lay with the bodies have sex with them apply makeup he would to some of the decapitated heads wash their hair and as he explained it because you could spend time with them and time was a big thing I believe in for him changing MOs from going into residence to abducting these women off the streets He's definitely in predator mode right now. And I believe that's actually even what he called it. More than likely, previous to 1974, he had a lot of fantasies. A lot of fantasies. And then he crossed the line. And now there's no turning back. And Ted Bundy, for the next four years, is going to run rough shot all over the United States murdering women in a most sophisticated and meticulous manner although he's evolving he's gonna to get to a point where he devolves where he he does not become he's not as aware he's not as meticulous he's not as careful as he once was a lot of that is because of arrogance a lot of that is narcissistic I've gotten away with it easy easy and he did I mean as you're gonna see so far we're gonna have four victims and there is no suspects okay two in one jurisdiction two now in a different jurisdiction right there creates problems right away because if they don't communicate they're not gonna see that there's a correlation okay and you wouldn't see a correlation as an investigator in between the first two and these two the mo's are completely different okay somebody broke inside the house did these things here these girls were abducted right off the streets you have to wonder if bundy knew that because he certainly was smart enough to know i could change my mo and they won't link i don't believe he did that Again, I believe it was just he wanted more time with these girls. And to abduct them, get them out of their comfort zone, out of their house, would allow that to happen. Now, again, Bundy does not talk much about Susan Rancourt. And I don't know the reason for that. You can only speculate. Did she wake up? Did she talk to him? Did she beg for her life in a certain way that made him feel... You know, I just don't know. And that's that's the damnedest misery of it. Because you want to know. You want to know each individual. What happened? How did it happen? Why did it happen? And tie it all together. And Bundy could have done that for us. But he didn't. He didn't go into detail about each killing. Some he did a little bit more than others. But there's just way too many questions left. And I... We go back to Manson and him saying he incinerated her skull in the fireplace. We just don't know whether that's true or not. Right? So those are the third and fourth victims of Ted Bundy. Our next video, we're going to go into some more victims in chronological order and see the evolution. How does he change? What does he change, if anything? And are we any closer to catching Ted Bundy than we were 
you know, at the beginning of the year, in January of 1974, when all this started. We are now in April 1974, and girls are just continuing to go missing. Let's hope that the police link them together, and we learn from it, and go forward. And our whole week-long look at serial killer and the perfect killing machine that is named Ted Bundy. So, until next time, Maine's out.